Well, hello to all my friends in the AES. I wish we could be together in person uh, next year, I guess. Um, it's been an incredible honor for me to serve as your vice president for the past two years. And I'm particularly excited about introducing our esteemed president, Dr. Alan Zipperstein. Now, um, I've been around academic surgery for a long time, and I think we all know that these presidential introductions tend to be opportunities to kind of roast the president um, using maybe pictures or stories as kind of cheap props. Um, but I, I thought this year was kind of different. Um, we've been through a terrible pandemic. There's all the political and social upheaval. And I thought it might be better to avoid that kind of uh, roasting. But then I thought, nah. No way. Um, so I think I'm just going to loosen my uh, AES tie. I've got several of these at home. And um, maybe even grab something here. This is just a little, a little something. And uh, I'm going to share my screen and let's get started. So who is Alan Superstein? Well, let's go back to the beginning. It turns out Alan was born in Dallas, Texas. Many of you may not know that. And what a cute little boy he was looking up to the stars. Now, this picture of young Alan, I think is just perfect. You can see his precocious, devilish mind at work and, and what the future might hold. Now, this great picture is of Alan's parents, Eleanor and Marvin. Alan's family was in Dallas, which is where he was born, because both his parents were in the medical field and were on the faculty at UT Southwestern. And both had really remarkable careers. His mother, Eleanor, was an outstanding PhD scientist and actually did some really seminal studies on pituitary biology. Look at this important work on ACTH producing cells that she published in 1965. And Alan's father also had a remarkable career as a physician scientist. And, and guess what field he was in? Yes, you guessed it. It was also endocrinology. It's no wonder Alan became an endocrine surgeon. Now, Alan's father was an MD PhD and was instrumental in helping to make UT Southwestern a world renowned academic medical center. Most of you will have heard of the famous duo of Brown and Goldstein at UT Southwestern who shared the Nobel for their work on cholesterol metabolism. Well, here is a quote from Dr. Brown himself. It is impossible to overestimate the impact that Dr. Sipperstein had on the meteoric development of our medical school in the 1960s. He was an inspirational mentor who drew more than a dozen future professors into his orbit while they were still in training. Quite the shoes to fill for now. Now, in 1973, the Sipperstein family moved to Northern California as his father, Alan's father, took a faculty position at UCSF. Thus was the start of the San Francisco connection in Alan's life. This next picture is of Alan in the 70s with his two sisters. Many of you may know that Alan is a music aficionado. And in fact, if you look closely at the picture, you can see him holding what looks like a music cassette, or at least some sort of music. So this is the 1970s in San Francisco. And when I saw that picture, I got to thinking, here's Alan. And look at this. Now, I have done some serious investigation and have yet to find a single person who remembers ever seeing Alan and Jerry Garcia together in the same room. 
So you can draw your own conclusions. Now, as the years went on, of course, Jerry's hair turned quite gray, whereas Alan, not so much. Now for college, Alan attended Stanford where he graduated in 1979. And then for med school, where did he go? Of course, it was back to Dallas, to UT Southwestern. And then for surgical residency, it was back to San Francisco for UCSF uh, uh, residency. During residency, Alan did a research fellowship in endocrine surgery. And then of course he stayed on faculty and rapidly rose through the ranks establishing himself as a truly world-renowned endocrine surgeon. One thing Alan definitely figured out how to do was to surround himself with outstanding colleagues. Look at this paper they published together in the World Journal of Surgery. Notice the authors. Four out of six of these authors have been AAES presidents. Now, I have no idea who R.A. Miller or J.J. Sancho are, but I've checked the Vegas lines and they are both odds on favorites to be future presidents of the society. We all know that Alan is an outstanding technical surgeon, but I think what is even more impressive is his ability to innovate. He has an uncanny knack for seeing the future way before the rest of us. <clears throat> Alan has been at the forefront of so many of the advances made in our field, including laparoscopic surgery, the use of laparoscopic ultrasound, RFA ablation of liver tumors. He was amongst the first in our ranks to recognize that ultrasound was going to be a useful tool for endocrine surgeons in regard to thyroid and parathyroid surgery. And here is a direct quote from past AAS president, Quan Du. Alan was the pioneer in surgeon performed ultrasound at UCSF, overcoming many obstacles and taught most of the faculty both the importance of ultrasound and surgical practice in the technique of how to do it. Alan has also published some truly seminal studies that serve as a guide to many of us when it comes to how to best conduct successful parathyroid surgery and also has led the way in regard to the posterior approach to adrenalectomy. Alan, of course, has also been an amazing leader in academic surgery. In 1999, he made his big move to Cleveland to lead the endocrine surgery group at the Cleveland Clinic. Now, why move from San Francisco, shown here, to Cleveland, isn't it obvious? The truth is that Alan also saw the future of Cleveland and uh, the city is no longer considered the mistake on the lake. Now Alan has built quite a powerhouse at the Cleveland Clinic. In 2008, he was named chairman of the endocrine surgery department. I'm not sure there's another endocrine surgery unit that's, that is its own department anywhere else in the country. He has an outstanding group in Cleveland with a fantastic fellowship, and he has mentored dozens of our colleagues. I know for a fact that Alan is incredibly proud of, of the fellows he has trained and the incredible legacy he is leaving for the future of our field. Let's hear from a few of Alan's colleagues and trainees. Dear Alan, congratulations on your presidency on the leadership of the AAES, on everything that you have done for the peers and friends and colleagues and students and so many people that you've touched throughout all these years at the AAES. So kudos on your presidential year. Kudos on your presidential year during the COVID time. This is a new printout of what was delivered to us about gathering uh, guidelines and I just wanted to have it in this video so when you and your family look at it onward you'll remember it was a COVID year and I wanted to share three words with you gratitude innovation and family I am grateful that you gave me my first job out of Emory and then provided mentorship and wind beneath the wings so that I can continue to evolve in my uh, endocrine surgery career and do the things that I'm doing now and help others do the things that they love to do. Innovation because you were born an innovator whether it's RFA, surgery, ultrasound, uh, manuscript, uh, 
uh, revision style, whatever it is, um, innovation is in your genes. And so I just want to celebrate that during this time when we're celebrating all you mean to the AAES. And finally, family. Thank you for letting me fly to my family in Phoenix. Um, they're grateful for that. I am grateful for that. And I also brought the uh, guest book. It's a pretty thick one from all of the gatherings in Cleveland. And your kiddos' notes from when they were this little are in there. And uh, all of the Cleveland Clinic family notes are there. And I cherish that. And I honor how you took care of your family, of your uh, life family, and of your work family. So uh, thank you, Innovate and family, and God bless you always. Hi, Ellen. So I was Dr. Ellen Sipperstein's second endocrine surgery fellow, following on the heels of the famous or infamous Dr. Kristen Wagner. And when I was moving to Cleveland from Boston, weary of the Boston real estate rental apartment prices, I decided to go with a more economical alternative. And that was that I decided to live in the Sipperstein's garage. Well, it was actually above the garage. It was a lovely carriage house apartment, but I like to say that I lived in Alan's garage because it sounds better. And I remember one day in the spring of my fellowship year, it was around the time of Holly's birthday and we were hanging out in the kitchen. We started to talk about what we might wanted to, to do for dinner. And um, we picked up the phone, we called Dr. Mira Milas, who was with us that year and lived down the street. We said, come on over Mira, we're having dinner, it's Holly's birthday. And I remember Alan's adorable 10 year old son, Alden, saying, dad, dad, are we having a party? Well, it was a party the whole year felt like a party. I had so much fun. I only remember the fun. I don't remember any of the work. So thank you, Alan, Mira, Holly, Aldea, Alden, Marion, and of course, Zuni. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all well and healthy and enjoying the conference. Um, I was asked to perhaps share a story about Dr. Ellen Sepersai, my boss, or Sip as I've always called him. So I'm here to do that. So here he is. The legend, Alan Sipperstein. So what can I tell you about him? Well, unfortunately, there's nothing too embarrassing. He never gets in trouble. Um, but what he is known around here at the clinic is that he is one of the most optimistic people you'll ever meet uh, because he'll tell you that everything's fine. Everything is always fine or will always be fine. So the world is ending. Everything will be fine. Your patient is dying, everything will be fine. So it's always nice to know that your boss thinks that everything will be fine. Um, the other story that I wanna tell you is that when I was a fellow, I remember taking a patient to the operating room, one of his patients, and right before the patient was about to go to sleep, he grabbed Dr. Superstein's hand and he said, Dr. Superstein, take good care of me. And I think I chuckled a little, and of course, he's not gonna correct him. And I remember thinking, wow, how appropriate is that name? Because that's what he is around here. He's he's Superstein, he's our Superman. He cares um, so much about his patients, and he cares so much about us. And I think all the fellows that he's trained will share my sentiments. So I wanna congratulate you, Dr. Superstein, on your two-year term as the president of AES. And um, we are lucky to have you around here. So thank you for all that you do. And I want to say hi to everybody, and I hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. So those who know Alan know that being a surgeon and an academic leader comes after his family. One of the fun parts of preparing this introduction was the chance to speak to some of Alan's family members and get a real sense of what a wonderful father, husband, and overall family man he is. Alan has two sons from his first marriage. That's Brian and Dylan. And when he married Holly, who is an MD, MBA, uh, he became dad to Holly's daughter, Aldea. And then he and Holly had two more kids, Alden and Marion. So five kids in total, quite productive and quite a handful, as you can imagine. And I've learned a bunch about the real Alan. He's apparently quite a handyman around the house and loves tinkering in his tool shed. And his daughter, Aldea, 
which and this won't surprise anyone, uh, says that he has a typical dad's sense of humor, and tries to tell jokes, and basically has his kids constantly rolling their eyes. He loves sci-fi movies, and basically Alan is a nerd. Not that that's a bad thing. Again, no surprise to anybody who knows him, he basically knows the answer to everything, as it becomes apparent when the family does the New York Times crossword puzzles together. And he is a rock and roll music aficionado, so clearly this must be part of the reason he moved to Cleveland to take advantage of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So as vice president for the past two years, I've had an inside view of Alan, the way his brilliant mind thinks and the way his warm heart leads. He has been a tireless and inspiring leader, especially during these difficult times. And I think he has overseen a remarkable period of terrific growth for this organization. We are all really very lucky to have had him as our leader for the past two years. So it is now my pleasure to introduce you to the 39th AES president, Dr. Alan Zipperstein. As these talks are pre-recorded, I have no idea what Rich just said, but I am sure that being a Harvard man, a gentleman, and a friend, that he exhibited the utmost in decorum and HIPAA compliance. And besides, I know where you live. I appreciate the honor and privilege of serving as your president over the past two years, a unique opportunity to give back to the organization that has been so instrumental in the formation of my career. Faced with the last minute cancellation of the 2020 meeting, I was humbled by the request of the council to continue my term for an additional year. I thank each of them for accepting my reciprocal offer to continue their duties as well. The pandemic touched each of us with personal and professional upheaval. The impulse is to retreat into our own lives. I am humbled by the outpouring and dedication of our entire membership that is, they have shown to this organization. The AES has come out stronger because of each of you. Before I begin my formal presentation, I need to recognize those who have supported me and have the greatest influence on my life. I would first like to thank my wife, Dr. Holly Miller, for her endless support and motivation throughout my career. An internist by training, she's devoted her professional career to leveraging the electronic medical record to improve the quality of health care. She has more energy and mitochondria than anyone I know a devoted mother and tireless gardener, and has the unenviable task of keeping me in line. My five children with one spouse are an endless source of pride and joy as they have grown into adults and found their place in the world, only occasionally causing me to age prematurely. My parents, Marvin and Eleanor, taught me curiosity and the wonders of scientific investigation from a young age. They met at Berkeley, California, both studying in Chekhov's lab of the wolf Chekhov effect. Growing up in Dallas, lacking babysitters, many school holidays and weekends were spent in their labs. My mother, now 91, was a pituitary cell biologist. As a child, the first operation I ever saw was her performing a bilateral adrenalectomy on rats. By subsequently studying the pituitary under the electron microscope, she was able to identify the cell type that changed and hence secretes ACTH. At some level, I could understand her work. It was very visual. She would show me pictures of cells in their organelles and tell me stories of how the cells worked. My father was an endocrinologist studying diabetes and cholesterol metabolism. He worked out the metabolic pathway of cholesterol synthesis, identifying HMG-CoA reductase as its rate limiting step, the target now used by statins. As a child, the science I did not understand, squiggly lines coming off a gas chromatograph, Exciting were the animals he used to map out these pathways. Yes, there were rats, but also sharks, frogs, iguanas, baboons. Unbeknownst to me at the time, all to be injected with radioactivity and meet a swift end. But I did absorb the excitement he had in doing experiments, and in particular discussing results with his fellows who would go on to become editors of Harrison's textbook of medicine, department chairs, and Nobel laureates. This was clearly a unique and rarefied environment to grow up in and you wonder why I pursued the career that I did. Orlo Clark served as my mentor during residency, fellowship, and ten years on faculty at UCSF. For a decade, we shared clinic and OR days. What an honor to be exposed to his greatness on a daily basis. A true certain scientist, master technician, gentleman, and friend. Words cannot express the impact he has had on my career 
and he rem remains with me every day. Thank you. I would like to share with you today some of my personal perspectives on endocrine surgery, both as an established surgical specialty as well as our professional organization, the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. To put things in perspective, we have many great accomplishments. We have evolved from a clinical interest within general surgery, a hobby I like to call it, to a mature specialty. For many of us, our dominant or exclusive practice is in endocrine surgery, and there are now accredited fellowship training pathways to get there. Specialization has allowed for clinical and scientific advancement with many new insights into the underlying disease processes and applying the right procedure to the right patient. There has been clear demonstration that high volume surgeons have better outcomes. Before I expand on these points further, I want to warn you in advance that the latter part of my talk is designed to move you out of your comfort zone and present you with future challenges that, as an organization and profession, we will be faced with. The world, as well as the science and practice of surgery, will continue to change. We will be held to a higher standard, both in terms of how we train those who want to enter our field, and to our patients in terms of the quality of care we provide and in evaluating new technologies. When I joined the AES, it was a much smaller organization. Everyone knew everyone else. Only a handful of larger institutions had more than one individual practicing endocrine surgery. Many combined their practice with breast surgery, surgical oncology, or general surgery. The main focus of meetings in those days was to present and discuss scientific papers. Our organization has greatly expanded in its role. The key areas of growth have been in service to our members and service to our patients. On a superficial level, this can be quantified by the sheer increase in the number of committees and task forces. Pry open the lid, and more impressive is the tremendous number of accomplishments and contributions to our organization. What is the key to this, this success? You, our membership. Historically, committee members were appointed by leadership. The more recent self-nomination process drove home to me the talent, depth, and eagerness to contribute to our organization. Creative ideas have spawned new projects and initiatives. Our members in training have benefited from the oversight provided by the Fellowship Committee as well as the Fellowship Accreditation Committee that set standards for training programs. Our members benefit from the work of the Career and Leadership Development Committee to help guide and advise members, particularly early in their careers. Our Education Committee serves us during and after training. The Research Committee provides precious seed money for new projects. Both members and patients benefit from the Endocrine Surgery Identity Committee that, among other things, has provided name recognition to the somewhat obscure term endocrine surgery. Our website and information technology committee has expanded our internet and importantly these days, social media presence. We have reached out to multiple patient groups through the patient advocacy committee, making them aware of our organization as well as providing educational resources. Our quality registry continues to expand its focus and has fostered multi-institutional collaboration. The Guidelines and Emerging Therapeutics Committee produced state-of-the-art papers promoting a best practice and giving us guidance on the use of new technologies. Our former Community Practice Committee has evolved into the Clinical Practice Community, a subtle but important name change. They advance the logistics of practice, such as coding and reimbursement, that applies to us all. Given the complexity of our organization, an ethics committee was started to make sure that we abide by the highest of standards. I am proud of the newly formed Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, who will ensure that all are welcomed and will thrive in our organization. Historically, general surgery residents who expressed an interest in endocrine surgery could gain additional exposure during residency as part of their research years or in some cases an ad hoc apprenticeship following training. I was fortunate to have a string of residents come spend an extra year of training with me. In an attempt to legitimize this, at least locally, I registered the fellowship through our graduate medical education department, so at least they would receive a fancy certificate at the end of training. It became apparent that several institutions had a similar arrangement and others had the desire to take on trainees. 15 years ago, I approached the council with the idea of starting a matching process for endocrine surgery fellowships. 
The motivations for this were several fold. This was the most equitable way to align applicants with places they would want to train. Previously, this was purely a first come, first serve process. The deeper motivation was to further legitimize the field of endocrine surgery as a distinct specialty. At that time, we were beginning to understand volume outcomes relationships, with the point being driven home when seeing a patient referred to our practice with a bad outcome that could have been avoided. Our field was also advancing quickly, hence requiring additional specialized training. There were changes in our understanding of the biology of thyroid cancer, the interpretation of fine needle aspirations, the extent of surgery required, and the optimal patient follow-up. From a technical point of view, surgeon performed ultrasound was relatively new. Energy sources were now more routinely used to perform thyroid surgery, and laparoscopic and subsequent robotic technologies were evolving. But potential concerns were raised as well. Our roots in a broad general surgery training were already being fragmented by colorectal and breast surgery evolving as distinct subspecialties, Integrated surgical programs, bypassing initial general surgery training, were on the horizon in plastics, vascular, and cardiothoracic surgery. Despite this, the Council approved the formation of a match process for endocrine surgery fellowships. Although not my intention, I was instantly tasked with taking on that responsibility. A word to the wise about coming up with any bright ideas you will instantly be placed in charge. Parenthetically, similar slips of the tongue landed me the job as a general surgery residency program director for 14 years. Back then, the matching process for the 13 inaugural programs was done on paper, as there was no commercially available computer program. Urban legend says that I did this on my kitchen table, somewhat more picturesque than the reality of this being done in my office. Our organization has advanced well beyond these early days. We now have goals and objectives for the teaching of our fellows. And there is now an accreditation process to ensure high standards for new and existing programs. So what are the future challenges in the education of our endocrine surgery fellows? We are fortunate to recruit the best and the brightest who excel clinically, technically, and academically. I do my best to treat each of my fellows as professional athletes. No matter how good they are in any of these areas, I push and challenge them to do better. My goal during the course of the year is to start with a general surgery chief resident and end with an independent practitioner. But there are challenges to this. As you know, CMS funds a large portion of graduate medical education with the intention that residents will provide care to underserved populations. Turning the page, however, you will find multiple regulations that limit any type of independent health care delivery. Despite their medical degree, they are treated as adolescents requiring parental supervision and sign-off for all of their activities. As opposed to being seen as a more junior member of the healthcare team, they are regarded as students by patients, insurers, and regulators. I'm not saying we go back to the good old days when I was a resident, typically on call and awake for the entire weekend. You checked in with your attending on Monday morning to let them know who had been admitted and operated on. Obviously, this past training allowed for clinical and operative independence However, any lapses in this independent clinical decision-making were brutally obvious by the next Morbidity and Mortality Conference. In some ways, we are fortunate that our fellowships are not under the ACGME. Such fellows are technically residents and under their same regulatory constraints. By bringing on our fellows as junior faculty, for example, we then have a pathway for greater independence. So how do we thread this needle? We need to create an environment that will best, best foster lifelong learners who are equipped to assess new literature and appropriately adopt changes into our rapidly advancing field. I feel that fellows are best served by being in a solid academic environment with multidisciplinary care and faculty who demonstrate competence as educators. To break this down somewhat, the academic environment allows for critical review of studies that guide our current and future practice pattern. It creates a varied exposure and ability to critically discuss the science guiding our clinical care. In an academic environment, exposure to residents and medical students allows the fellows themselves to mature as educators. Multidisciplinary care exposes fellows to the perspectives of other medical specialties and the importance of a team-based approach to care. Multidisciplinary conferences and tumor boards 
reinforce this. We also must demonstrate that our faculty show competency as professional educators to promote optimal learning. We have moved beyond the apprentice model in medical education. An active understanding of competency-based assessment, communication skills, and implicit bias training is essential for the modern educator. Our organization is actively working to meet these future challenges. A project on entrustable professional activities will provide a pathway to ensure independent clinical skills at the completion of training. Raising the bar on our current fellowship accreditation standards will ensure an optimum environment for training and maturations. So what are the challenges I'm asking of you? We need the best to pursue a career in endocrine surgery. Seek out a bright, motivated, and diverse group of trainees and infect them with your passion for what you do. We must challenge ourselves to be at the top of our game as professional educators. This sometimes requires learning new tools, active engagement, and pushing our trainees to be the best they can be. We need to restructure our training programs to guarantee that when fellows are pushed out of the nest at the end of training, they will fly. But that is not the end. I challenge our senior members to mentor those rising within our organization so that they too meet their full potential. For the last section of my talk, I want to focus on new technological development. Let's go back to 1990 when I just finished my residency and laparoscopic cholecystectomy was in its infancy. Having been developed in the private sector, there was immediate skepticism and pushback on the part of academia. There was rapid recognition of the advantages of a laparoscopic approach on reducing postoperative pain, earlier return to bowel function, and shorter hospitalization. Appropriate concern was raised about the higher incidence of common bile duct injury with potential life-threatening consequences. Gallbladder perforation with spillage of bile and stones was frequent. Open cholecystectomy had been performed with a top-down approach with the fundus and body of the gallbladder initially dissected from the liver, leaving the cystic duct and artery on a clearly defined pedicle. Surgeons were unfamiliar with dissecting the triangle of Colo early in the case, as current teaching to identify the critical view of these structures had not been developed. The basics of laparoscopy were novel as well. Many learned for the first time the foreign ergonomics that moving your hand upward moves the instrument down. The concept of viewing a two-dimensional screen to operate on a three-dimensional world was novel. The video systems were primitive, and I often compare them to images of Neil Armstrong's first steps on the moon. Ratcheted graspers had not, did not exist, so we had digital nerve palsies from squeezing the instruments closed for hours. Surgeons new to laparoscopy would often come back from only a weekend course to do their first case. So how is it possible to recruit patients to a new and unproven technology? They were beating down the door for the latest and greatest in medical advancement. In a stroke of marketing genius, this was sold as a laser cholecystectomy. The kernel of truth is that some early adopters used a laser fiber as a thermal dissecting instrument. This was quickly abandoned as it would slice open the gallbladder and any other structure it touched. Patients did not understand the word laparoscopic, so laser cholecystectomy was a perfect marketing term to seduce patients into thinking they were getting the future of medicine. To digress for a minute, we continue to this day to market our operations with somewhat misleading terms. When we use the term robotic surgery, patients think of R2-D2 standing beside us at the console guiding our hands. We would get a skeptical look from our patients if we told the patient they were being done using a remote manipulating instrument with articulating arms. We offer patients a minimally invasive parathyroidectomy as opposed to the traditional old-fashioned approach. Which would you choose? Instead, try the thought experiment of offering your patient an incomplete parathyroid exploration versus a comprehensive parathyroid exploration. Which would you choose? My point is that the words we use have the ability to influence a patient's decision making. In offering a new technology to a patient, our duty in the consent process is to allow the patient to make a fully informed decision. 
I would argue that the terms we choose to describe our procedures should be objective and free from any perceived bias. The early laparoscopic era was one of great excitement. In service to our patients, it was clearly recognized that these advances could revolutionize surgery. The motivation behind many of these advances may not have been so laudable. There was tremendous ego and name recognition behind being the first to perform a new operation or develop a new technique. As a techie, it was exciting for me to be involved with new product development, some of which came to fruition and many fizzled. The disruptive technology of laparoscopic surgery quickly overtook open procedures in norm numerous specialties. These changes swept into clinical practice before more stringent hospital credentialing, IRB, and regulatory bodies could have slowed it. There was essentially no external regulation in taking on new procedures. In wanting to do a laparoscopic adrenalectomy for the first time, there was no specific credentialing or constraint. The justification in our minds is that we were doing the exact same operation, only modifying the approach. A half-truth at best. As with many laparoscopic procedures early in the learning curve, these were done as two attending cases. Yes, a step towards responsibility. I had the pleasure to do all our early adrenalectomies with my colleague and friend, Quan Du. In the interest of safety, having someone to bounce ideas off of and working with someone you felt comfortable with made sense. In reality, I wonder at times whether this allowed us to incorrectly convince one another that it was safe to cut into some vital structure. In preparation for our first case, we discussed in detail trocar placement and steps of the operation. A training video was reviewed multiple times. As is often done, a proctor with prior experience was scheduled to attend. Canceling his trip at the last minute, we reviewed the training videotape in the operating room just before the patient was wheeled in and proceeded. Through either careful preparation or luck, all went well. That was the pioneering spirit of the day and guilty as charged. Was this the mark of innovation or reckless irresponsibility? In that era, small adrenal glands were often removed through an open posterior approach made possible by excision of the 11th rib to gain access, a procedure most of you never had the privilege to perform. There was speculation that a similar laparoscopic approach could be applied, but challenged by the fact there was no obvious working space to gain access to the adrenal. I had been invited to a conference in Istanbul, Turkey. Through absolute coincidence, a colleague mentioned that a professor at his university, Dr. Selçuk Merjan, had actually performed several of these procedures. I accepted the invitation to scrub in on his eighth case. This was prior to any type of outcome data or a subsequent presentation of the technique at our 1995 meeting and publication in surgery. Returning to San Francisco, we quickly lined up a patient for the procedure. Was this the mark of innovation or reckless irresponsibility? Many new and relatively untested devices were appearing in the operating room. The FDA regulates new devices in interesting ways. To oversimplify, if a device is truly novel, then it must go through a rigid investigational device protocol. The FDA carefully reviews the study design, patient enrollment criteria, and strict data collection requirements. Having been involved in such studies, I can attest to the rigid external oversight and monitoring that occurs for all phases of the study. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement, TAVR, is a recent example where I think this was done well. There was obviously a high stakes device where technical errors in positioning or failure of the device itself could have instant and disastrous consequences. The device had the potential to avoid the morbidity of median sternotomy and call it cardiopulmonary bypass. Multiple centers participated with careful training in the procedure and strict adherence to the protocol. This led to rapid approval of the device with wide clinical adoption. Many devices go through what is called a 510K approval process. This is much more rapid and requires no human testing prior to being placed on the market. So how can this happen? The manufacturer is required to demonstrate that the new product is substantially equivalent to, or as the FDA uses the term, predicated upon an existing device that has already been validated. For example, minimal, minimal modification of a stapling device or the addition of smoke evacuation tubing to an existing cautery pencil, this makes sense. 
In other situations, I find it a bit of a stretch of the imagination. I will impugn myself with another case in point. An engineer, whom I had done laparoscopic ultrasound development work with, called me to let me know he had moved to a new company. They were developing a device for the thermal destruction of prostate tumors using radiofrequency energy, a fancy term for the bovi. I told him I had little interest in the prostate, but saw potential treatment for liver. At that time, local treatment of liver tumors was done with cryoablation. A large probe was placed into the lesion and two lengthy freeze-thaw cycles were performed. With expansion of the ice ball, the surface of the liver, particularly when serotic, would crack. A patient already hypothermic from a laparotomy would become more hypothermic. A patient who was already coagulopathic upon thawing of the ice ball would go into DIC from the acute release of cellular debris into the vasculature. So then I went to work. Extensive time was spent in the animal laboratory modifying the device itself and determining the appropriate power and time settings to create reproducible zones of ablation. How this device got 510K approval through the FDA is still somewhat of a mystery to me. Yes, there were devices with protruding prongs that used electrical energy for fulguration. None were widely used and for very different applications. The other interesting trick is that the devices may be approved for more general application before being allowed to be marketed for a more specific purpose. In these cases, early devices got FDA approval for soft tissue ablation. In this case, the soft tissue was normal pig liver. The company could in no way market the device with any statements relating to treating cancer or any specific organ. It is up to the discretion of the user to determine which soft tissue to ablate. This was also an error when it was thought dangerous to approach any cancer laparoscopically. Laparoscopic colectomy for colon cancer was a case in point. Early on, tumors were grossly fractured resulting in carcinomatosis and withdrawn without specimen retrieval bags resulting in port site recurrence. There was also resistance from academia who appropriately claimed validation studies were lacking, but at the same time felt their practices threatened as they had not yet learned advanced laparoscopic skills. There was even speculation that the carbon dioxide atmosphere within the abdominal cavity in some ways promoted tumor growth, a theory that was obviously disproved. I was fortunate in having access to early laparoscopic ultrasound equipment, as well as experience in performing ultrasound guided liver biopsies. It was not an enormous stretch to use the same technique for the placement of these early ablation catheters. The first patient treated had a pancreatic islet cell cancer that had metastasized to the liver. The first series of patients was reported at these meetings in 1997 and described the technique and initial outcome of six patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor to the liver. Was this the mark of innovation or reckless irresponsibility? For this technology to be accepted by the more skeptical surgical oncology community, community in particular for the treatment of colorectal metastases, a much more rigid approach would need to be applied. A prospective study was approved under the IRB with extensive data collection. There was a dedicated research coordinator to ensure proper recruitment and compliance with long-term follow-up. Anticipating external criticism, particular attention was paid to choosing appropriate outcomes to monitor. In particular, local recurrence, that is failure to completely ablate the lesion, was monitored at three months intervals and judged by radiologists not involved in the study. To maintain objectivity, I refrain from any paid consulting agreements. Jumping ahead, these studies were ultimately used to, to approach the FDA to a, obtain a specific indication to treat liver tumors. In order to facilitate the adoption, AMA was approached for the two-step process of first obtaining a CPT code and subsequent assignment an, of an RVU for the procedure. But those were the good old days. Although, at least for now, FDA regulations for new devices remain similar, we are, however, being held to a higher standard by our patients, our institutions, and our payers. With some significant and well-publicized failures of new technology, patients have become more skeptical of new devices and procedures. The Netflix documentary, The Bleeding Edge, examines potential hazards of new technology if rapidly pushed onto market by manufacturers and overzealously adopted by surgeons. Case in point, 
are metal-on-metal -metal hip implants, initially thought more durable than metal and plastic implants. Not appreciated was that the metal grinding on metal caused cobalt and chromium to be released with local and systemic ailments, including mental status changes. The Assure device was thought to be an easier and minimally invasive approach to fallopian tube occlusion. Hysteroscopic placement of this beaded device would induce inflammation and obliteration of the fallopian tube. The metal, unfortunately, would erode through the fallopian tube, causing infection and damage to adjacent viscera. Although this complication was recognized, marketing forces in the United States allowed it to be used long after it had been pulled in Europe. I would encourage you to watch this documentary. Although emphasizing failure rather than success, it does give insight into why patients may be skeptical accepting nascent technologies. So what can we as an organization do to raise the bar for the evaluation acceptance of new technologies? In some ways, I say if the FDA won't rise to the occasion to require multi-center externally monitored studies, then we as an organization should provide a platform to do so. Yes, there is risk that some progress may be slowed. Cost will be a challenge. Institutional barriers will have to be broken. I think it is important to let our egos down and work as collaborative groups as opposed to lone pioneers. I have been guilty of this in the past. This is a big ask. It won't happen overnight. The AES as an organization is ideally suited to lead these challenges. Our patients will reap the benefits. The AES is a great organization. We have matured as the pinnacle of clinical investigation with service to our members and to our patients. I am looking forward to the challenges ahead. It has been an honor to serve as your president, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Alan, that was, that was amazing talk, very, uh thoughtful as uh, uh, as expected and uh, we really I'm sure I can speak for everyone um, not only about your talk but also more importantly I guess about the last two years uh, amazing leadership um, as I said in my talk inspiring leadership and, and it, it really um, I, I think all of us really appreciate it um, so th thanks for all of your efforts and, and I'm very humbled and flattered by your kind introduction, uh, Rich. I just want to know whether you finished that bottle during during my talk. I still have a little bit left here in my office. So okay, on. good. <laughs> uh, Alan, you know, I just wanted to um, uh, thank you so much for that wonderful and thought-provoking talk. Uh, it's definitely a great topic for us to take into the next five, 10 years and really focus on. Um, so on behalf of the AAS, I just wanted to thank you for really two years of incredible leadership. Um, your strength, calm, and ingenuity really helped see us through some of uh, the most challenging times imaginable. And uh, on a personal note, I'm going to miss talking to you nearly every day. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the AAS sent you a package, and uh, uh, if you'd open it up now, uh, we got you this token of appreciation for your service uh, and dedication. Uh, and we hope it'll earn a prominent spot uh, so that when you see it, you'll be reminded of all your friends and uh, colleagues at the AAS. It's like box within a box. Yeah, nesting dolls. Uh oh. <laughs> Don't so I have my, my uh, this thing weighs a ton. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So you it's, uh, of course, the uh, AES rhinoceros here. Thank you, thank you. We like the rhinoceros because it looks like it's listening intently to you, uh, like we all listen to you, uh, to your words of wisdom. So thanks, Alan. My, my pleasure. Well, thanks, Rich and uh, and Alan. That was fantastic, and uh, we all hope to uh, to uh, live up to you, the, the history of this organization. And uh, that was fantastic. And Alan also. 
for as much as we've spoken this year, it's been fabulous getting to work with you. And I've heard a lot about um, Apple's experiences with you when she, she lived with you in Cleveland and um, all great things. And we're all um, very proud to have worked with you over the last couple of years. Um, so without further ado, the science must go on. So our next, um, our next session will be starting promptly at 11 a.m. Central, so in seven minutes. And we have the pleasure of having past president uh, Janice, Janice Basica um, giving the uh, distinguished moderator session, which I've heard and is fabulous. And it, should, it, be, uh, it will be a fun talk and a fun session. Um, so please take a quick break and we'll see you back in a few minutes. Congratulations, Alan. Thank you, Carrie. Outstanding job.